Good morning, everyone. This is Nathan Lindorf with The Rational Independent. Uh, one of the fun things about analyzing the leftist narrative is that it's kind of like a merry-go-round. Round and round we go, and we have a flavor of the day, and whatever happens to be the hot topic, that's what gets so much press. But on a slow news day, there's basically a short list of favorite topics that pop up again and again whenever the news cycle slows down a little bit. There's not much going on in Trump land right now. There's not that much interesting to write. You're not going to get that many clicks. So what do we have? One of the top articles, Maryland bill would force gun owners to get $300,000 worth of liability insurance to wear or carry guns in Maryland. It's been a little while since we've talked guns. So we're going to need to just frame this properly. In the United States, states are not allowed to make laws that are contrary to the federal constitution. There's a supremacy clause that basically says, if there's a conflict between state law and federal law, federal law trumps. The federal law has rights in the constitution that are articulated. And what I mean by that is, So right off the bat, we need to understand we're talking about state legislatures. They're only able to pass and enforce laws that are not in conflict with the federal constitution. So if we look at the federal constitution, and there's a whole body of laws associated with this and judicial precedent, et cetera, but I'm kind of a nerd originalist. I'm not, I'm not enough of a nerd that I'm gonna know all the case law. I'm not a lawyer, but I can follow first principles. I think we all can. And if you look at the Second Amendment, it's very clear. At the time of the Second Amendment, there was no National Guard. There was no standing army. There was not, <clears throat> I will say there's no standing army in the way we know it now. The modern military establishment is very different than what the founders envisioned. And also, in the United States was an agrarian country. 90 some odd percent of the population lived on farms where they produced what they ate and some surplus goods. With industrialization, that's shifted. So now only a few percent of the population grows the food and everyone else is free to do other stuff, including being part of a permanent standing army and that sort of thing. So it was just very rare that in times of peace, there was any kind of serious military presence armed military presence in an organized fashion anywhere. That's why they used militias. A militia was a civilian force. People, regular civilians, called up into military service with short notice in order to protect the homeland, deal with natural disasters, fight off invaders, whatever. Keeping in mind that we're looking at the framers in the frame of reference of the Revolutionary War, when the framers talk about militias, they're talking about inherently the civilian population that may be called up to function in a military fashion with short notice. They just fought the Revolutionary War with militias and a standing army combination. They all the regu- all the militias disbanded. Most of the military disbanded because you couldn't afford to keep them. Everyone has to go back to their life and grow their food. So after the Revolutionary War, everyone goes home. But they had no idea if they were going to get invaded again. I mean, look at the War of 1812. It certainly happened. The, the United States was not the world superpower then that it is now. With that context, the Second Amendment says, basically, for a well-regulated militia, which in this context means not federal regulation, but what it means is a well-ordered, functional, effective militia. Put another way, you could say, the Second Amendment starts by saying, in order to have a militia that's going to be an effective fighting force, there can be no reliance on federal armories or weapons depots or anything like that. If you're a part of the militia and you get called up, you need to bring your guns with you. We need you to bring your own personal weapons to fight in the militia should you be called up. Therefore, it makes sense that regular civilians should not be constrained by the government. The government should not infringe on the right of people to keep or bear arms. 
that means people, regular civilians, are inherently protected from government regulation that infringes on their right to keep and bear arms. Now, back to the law. Maryland bill would force gun owners to get $300,000 liability insurance to wear or carry. I feel like that sounds like an infringement on Maryland citizens' rights to keep and bear arms. Huh. Maryland House Democrats introduced... Ah, go away. Maryland House Democrats introduced a controversial gun safety bill requiring gun owners to forfeit their ability to wear or carry without firearm liability insurance. Gun safety is a euphemism. It's crap. Gun safety is federal regulation. Ah. Gun safety is code for we want to infringe on the rights of law-abiding citizens. And we know that because we're creating a law, an additional law a gun safety measure, gun safety bill, okay? In the name of safety, we are further constraining the activities of who? There's two classes of people in society, people who obey the law and people who don't obey the law. Generally, we call the people who obey the law, civilians, citizens, whatever, and the people who don't obey the law, it's criminals. The definition of criminal is someone who's broken the law, typically and gotten caught in convicted and all that other stuff. Okay. So who is going to be affected by passing an additional law regarding how you handle your guns? The criminals who are already breaking the law or the citizens who are trying to abide by the law and stay compliant and obedient to the laws on the books? By definition, this law will do nothing to impact the actions of people who are already breaking the law. So right off the bat, it's a fool's errand. You're chasing the wrong group of people. Okay. Details on the bill. When asked about the motivation behind the legislation, Hill told the news a constituent came to her with the idea that gun owners should bear some liability in cases where there is damage because of guns being used in ways that cause harm. Well, by that reasoning, if a home invader breaks into your home and threatens to, or, and threatens to rape your wife, murder your children, kill you, whatever, and you shoot that person, you could be sued because you used guns in a way that caused harm. You can see why this reasoning is specious. That's not a reasoning to make a law, particularly a non-constitutional one. Shockingly, a Republican questioned the legality of the bill. This bill places an unconstitutional burden on citizens to own a firearm. So there's this weird legal theory that I don't like. But again, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. But let's look at it. There's a weird theory proposed by the left called disparate impact. It's another way of describing equity. It's another way of saying we need to enforce equal outcomes. And it says, if a law can be shown to have more of an impact on one population group than another, that law is void, it's unconstitutional, it's not allowed. This is, this is bad reasoning. This is twisted reasoning. There is, let me put it this way. Speeding tickets have a disparate impact on people who speed. Drivers who choose habitually to drive above the speed limit are going to have a disparate impact from laws that punish that behavior. If you then turn around and say, let's let's pick a fun group, Mongolians. Let's say if Mongol if certain Mongolians, you know, from from their heritage, they immigrate to America and they just love driving cars so much that they always drive 20 miles over the speed limit. They would get more tickets. And then you could run a statistical analysis and say, Mongolians get more speeding tickets. Therefore, speeding tickets are unconstitutional because they have a disparate impact on Mongolians. It's nonsense. You can see how this gets all twisted up. However, it is important to say that if there's a constitutional right, you cannot constrain people's access to that right. 
that's what makes it an unconstitutional burden on citizens. You're infringing on that right. You are saying, before you can exercise this right, we're not allowed to infringe, we're gonna make this harder. It's, it, that reasoning encompasses most gun regulation is why most gun regulation is frankly unconstitutional. That may make you uncomfortable with what that means to, to be an American. That doesn't change the constitution. If you don't like the second amendment, change the second amendment. If you can't change the Second Amendment, maybe recognize that you're in the minority. And all you lovely people who love to praise our democracy could recognize the fact that most people don't agree with you. And in a democracy, if you're in the minority, you don't get your way. Let's throw on that, just some interesting things to talk about. Anyway, I do want to point out one thing here, which is in the event that this kind of law passes muster, and is allowed to stand as the law of the land, whether it's getting a concealed weapons permit or taking a firearm safety course or paying a tax stamp for particular types of weapons or whatever. Regardless of what you do there, any burden that you place on exercising this constitutional right is going to be more difficult to bear for people who are of lesser means. What do I mean by that? Well, if you have to, if you, if you live in a lefty district and there's a law in the books that says you need to take a $500 training course before you can carry a gun and you are a night janitor, you have to walk to and from work because you're broke and you're walking in the middle of the night at odd hours times when there's not as much police presence, which means it's more likely that you might become a victim of crime, particularly in these areas where there's not a lot of policing that's allowed to happen because police are bad or something. That means you need that weapon for self-defense, but you don't have any money. So you may choose to not have that weapon because you don't have the money. And, or you may choose to carry it illegally now you're a criminal. You've just turned a good citizen into a criminal because of regulation. Either way, that has more of an impact on you than, again, taking kind of this, this New York City, you know, if you're a New York City night, night janitor somewhere, you might need that. If you're a Wall Street executive and you need to take a $500 training course, if you need to pay a $5,000 tax stamp, what, you, just, you just pay it. You get to carry, it's fine. You get to stay legal because proportionally that cost means almost nothing to you. Whereas it might be the difference between life and death, literally, for a very low means night janitor who's vulnerable as they go to and from work. That creates a situation where even though the law is the same for all parties, it does impact one group more than another. This is the case of all regulation. I mean, the simple truth is people complain about the wealthy escaping taxes, avoiding taxes, loopholes, blah, blah, blah. That's why God invented lawyers. <laughs> That's how the, the... If you have the money to avoid the taxes, most people will gladly spend the money on a lawyer or an accountant to help them get around the taxes rather than just pay the taxes, especially if it means they can pay the lawyer half of what they would have paid in taxes. They'll do that every day and twice on Tuesday because it's more cost effective. The, the crux of all of this is to say, this kind of bill does place, place an unconstitutional burden on citizens to own a firearm. And that burden will impact those who are poor more than those who are wealthy. That's just the truth. The fact of the matter is, I can afford an insurance policy and still carry. And I will carry on doing what I'm doing. Some insurance companies get richer. Some politicians get a few pats on the back for doing something great. And a poor person has to choose between either being an illegal possessor of a firearm or being unable to defend themselves when the police are not available. That's the direct result of what we're talking about here. Ironically, there's a criminal defense attorney 
that says this legislation aims to enhance accountability among police officers, particularly addressing the disproportionate impact of their misuse of deadly force on the black community. In essence, the legislation introduces a mechanism whereby repeated violations of the statute could lead insurance carriers to consider an officer a liability, rendering them uninsurable. This is pointing to a very interesting layer to what we're doing in the United States right now. There are many constitutional provisions that protect our rights and pro by prohibiting the government from doing something. And the law is on the books that says the government cannot explicitly hire a third party private entity to do what itself is banned from doing. But can it suggest? Can it advise if the Biden administration sits down with Facebook censorship and says, we would like you, we think it would be wise, we think it would be a good idea ahead of this election, if you went ahead and you just made sure that it was a little more difficult to share news or information about this, this, or this damaging story. Where does that fall? Personally, I think it's pretty skeevy. Is it legal? Maybe. Who's going to pick a fight with the federal government? There's only a handful of people that can do that. The federal government has essentially unlimited resources. Here we have another thing. What they're effectively saying is, if you're not behaving the way that the, the way, if you're a person in society, a cop in a black community, and you're not behaving the way we want you to behave, we could remove your constitutional right to carry a gun because you'd be uninsurable. In other words, a private company, insurance company's decision to classify you as uninsurable just removed a constitutionally protected right. The government can't remove that right, but can the insurance company? Can the government say, sure, you can carry if you have a policy? But then over here, the policymaker says, uh, no, we're not gonna give you a policy. Now, where are you? Effectively, you've been banned from carrying a weapon from a government policy, but one degree removed, so maybe it's constitutional. This is the framework that we're seeing pop up over and over in multiple contexts, because it's far more effective for tyrants and totalitarians in the federal government to use this kind of surrogate or proxy to accomplish the control on the society that they cannot do themselves. Anyway, there's more nonsense as we go through here, but the short version is, this is a terrible law. It shouldn't pass. If it passes, it should be challenged in court and not ruled unconstitutional and go away. But this kind of gun safety measure is on the left's agenda. And the next time we have a crisis or an incident, it's gonna pop back up and all of these same narratives are gonna be played again. We're gonna push, we're gonna, the merry-go-round will come around and we're gonna do this dance all over again. It's only a matter of time. This is Nathan Lindorf with the Rational Independent. Good luck out there.